Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Orangeville, Ontario Councillor Tess Prendergast. But before we get into today's interview, we'd like to say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website located at www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, on to the show. Tess, I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down and talking about yourself in the town of Orangeville. I want to kind of get off to a normal start on this show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Tess? Well, um, you know, I, I think it started when when I was a, a young student myself in school. I always liked to um, sign up for a student council or try to get involved in as many aspects of the school life as possible. And I see municipal government as an extension of that wanting to serve and just ameliorate your your local community and make lives for people better um, in your immediate surroundings. I know just municipal government, you're able to change people's lives directly. Actionable change that can happen quite quickly. Um, can I give you a couple of examples, Chris, just uh, within my you first year? You go for it, Tess. You go yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> I am... Um, you know what, just sometimes getting getting an email about something, for example, um, lack of children's changing tables in a, a change room at our local community center. Send a couple emails, find out that it's it's not so hard to get some things put in it if people in the community are, are asking, letting elected officials know. And usually if it's within the budget, those are things that can be done quite quickly. Um, another item was... Um, this year, we we had a push for um, free menstrual products in town facilities. So that was the first motion I put forward as a councillor was for um, the investigation for staff to put menstrual products in change rooms and uh, public bathroom facilities within town. Our local school boards have those in the high schools. And I was just thinking that could be an extension of what the town could offer. And the cost is actually quite minimal. And if we're normalizing um, menstruation, women's health, uh, people who menstruate their health, it's important. And it helps have those conversations. I, I look at those kind of products the same as toilet paper. So I'm so glad that the town and our council was embracing to that movement. So before we get to talk about the town, I want to continue on the conversation about you for a few mm. minutes, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. Now, I, I traditionally don't do a lot of research on my guests because I want to learn from them. But the one thing I do look at is elections. When was the first time you ran? When was the first time you put your name for it? And in my discovery, you had a very busy 2022. You ran provincially yeah. and then you ran municipally. Uh, you're not the only one, particularly in southwestern Ontario, who did that. But I want to ask you... How was your 2022? Because I can imagine going from a provincial campaign where they're talking about provincial issues and then transposing that to a municipal campaign where you're talking about more local micro issues was probably a bit of a culture shock in some sense. But for you, what was it like to campaign twice in one year, but also campaign twice and then win successfully in your second time out? Well, um, I would say, so my first foray was in 2022, running provincially in Dufferin Caledon. Um, and, you know, that was, a, it was, it was a big culture shock, a big change for me to go out and hit the campaign trail. Um, my background is in teaching. I haven't ever done that before, aside from, you know, high school student council kind of stuff. And those, the main issues were affordability, um, housing, access to affordable housing, healthcare and education. So the education piece is what really attracted me to running provincially. Um, but you know, and yourself being in the municipal world and talking to a lot of municipal politicians, you see that um, all of those big ticket kind of issues that affect the province trickle down to the municipality. So lack of access to healthcare, it affects the municipality. Um, it affects our food bank. It affects seeking affordable housing, people that are in need of supports. And maybe where there are gaps um, federally or provincially, we see those gaps as they grow by the time they hit the municipality. 
Uh, so big issues municipally. Um, one big thing in Orangeville is affordability, our tax rate, um, access to health care, close to home, finding family doctors, um, and just trying to have healthy, happy families in our communities. And I think that's all what Ontarians are, are striving for. You 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 successfully are elected last year, one year ago, almost last month, October. Well, one year ago, last month. Yeah. And it's probably been a very big culture shock for you because uh, making decisions that impact your community. And as you so eloquently put it, the next day, the people you are the closest to the people and you are the ones that are making the impact of the people, literally the closest to them. For you, for someone who is a relatively, and I say this uh, sort of with a broad stroke, a green candidate, a green counselor, because it's your first year in office, how has yeah. the experience been as a municipal official in the town of Orangeville for yourself in addressing some of these big picture items that traditionally aren't in the municipal jurisdiction? Um, you know, that that's a really good question. I, I think we look at how we can offset the cost of living as best as we can um, as municipal officials without affecting people's taxes, right? So what are some low to no cost ways that the town can help people when we, we can't really address affordable housing on our own because it's too big of an issue and it's too expensive and that would require partnership from the province or the federal government. Um, but the town of Orangeville, just before I came in, the, the term before me, um, approved a two-year transit program for free transit. So here we are offsetting the cost of transit for individuals who use the bus. And what we've seen is over 100% increase in, in ridership. Um, we have a town of over 30,000 people, but now we have packed buses. We have youth, seniors who might have only been making one trip to the store a week, for affordability reasons, are now getting out more often to see their friends, and they're contributing to the economy in that way. Um, so we have the free transit program and free menstrual products, and there are other ways too that the town is really just trying to make a positive impact on, I guess the the checkbooks of people if um, if possible. So those are just small little things that we're trying to do on a local front to help the people that live here. How do you balance that, though? Because after a year in office, I can imagine you understand the concept that you're never going to please 100 percent of your residents with yeah. every decision you make. And for those who are not watching this, you didn't hear that. The counselor just said no. So I want to know for you, how do you make decisions that are going to impact the majority of people, but knowing that the decisions you make are not going to be liked by 100 percent of the people? Uh, I, I think when you initially throw your hat into this, you know that people will um, not always be happy, you know, but no one is ever always happy. And usually the uh, sometimes the, the detractors of the most negative voices sometimes seem to be the loudest. You don't always hear the accolades. Right. So um, not everyone has a different opinion. And, um, you know, everyone uses services differently. So let's say, for example, if someone is not using the public pool, they don't see the use in perhaps investing money into that pool. But you have to look at the big picture health of the community. You have healthy families, um, you have people that want to contribute to the community, and hopefully um, people will be able to have kind of that that insight into it. You're, you're right. You, you're you're going to have people who are dis distracted by the issues that you are voted on at council. But as an elected official, you have to give them their your time to vent. Yeah. You have to give them, but in a respectful manner. And I say respectful, like if you're name calling, you don't have to give them their time. That's my opinion. If they're saying negative things about you, you don't need to give them their time, but you have to give them their time if they're doing it in a respectful manner. If they ask for your time to say, I, I yeah. just want to understand better why you came up with this decision, you have to give it. How important is it for you to, after you've made those tough decisions, those decisions that may not please everyone to say, okay, I know if I go to the grocery store tomorrow, I might get stopped and be asked why I voted a certain way. And I have to give my time and I have to give my energy to them for 20 minutes, half hour, 10 minutes. Yep. Um, and you know, but that's all about being an engaged citizen, right? And I value all of those conversations, even if someone doesn't agree with the way that I voted. Um, you know, to the, the public just sees perhaps like one layer of the onion. And now being on council for a year, I'm privy to perhaps more information. And I have a more holistic view of 
of the town, right? And the budgetary implications, it all comes down to that, Chris. Really, every decision that we make has to be one done with like financial prudency. We don't want our taxes to go up. And at the end of the day, I'm a taxpayer in town. I want services. I want service level increases, but I don't want to pay 12% in taxes. So every decision comes with that balance, right? And it would be nice to have all of these great, awesome things in town. And we're trying to make the things that we can have uh, financially responsible. And I think our council really always takes that into account when making decisions. What's the best for the community as a whole? What can bring us forward in a, in a progressive but financially responsible way? Now, I, 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 we're recording this interview in the middle of the day uh, on the first week of November. It's going to be airing in the middle of November. But I'm catching you at work. And now I can imagine that you are a busy person. You have your yeah. full-time job, you're a counselor, and then you have your private life aft outside of this as well. Um, in one year's time, you've had to sort of been able to sort of juggle all three balls up in the air. Mm -hmm. Has it been challenging to sort of adapt to the realities that is municipal government? Because prior to people getting involved, most people don't understand that it is a full time job with not full time pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, what? it's what you make of it. Right. Um, I I love my town. I love Orangeville so much that I feel like I'm already an ambassador for Orangeville without having been elected to council. I'm going to the events with my family. I have young children, six and eight. Um, I'm a scout leader in town. I do beavers and cubs. So I'm just part of the community in in every regard. We go to the library every week. So all of these things that I've already been doing are kind of part and parcel of being a counselor. I think a big part of that role is being an ambassador for where you live. You, you really need to love the place you are and want to make it better, right? Orangeville's fantastic. Let's just make it a little bit better. And that's listening to the residents, listening to great ideas that people have. Because let's face it, politicians, we're just kind of like uh, facilitators of opinions and information and just trying to ascertain what the consensus is and try to bring that forward and uh, maybe put new policies in or bring new things to town. That's the will of what the majority of the people would, would like to see. But yeah, my life is super busy, Chris. Um, working full time, I'm lucky enough to work at a school in Orangeville. I can, I can walk to town hall from my house. I can walk to my school. Um, I have a very supportive spouse, my husband, Ryan. He also works in, in, in town too. So that affords me a little bit more freedom. Uh, without him, I don't think I'd be able to be doing this, to be honest. It's uh, some late nights, you know, more meetings than I'm used to. But it's it really is all worth it because I'm modeling to my own children and the children at school that um, throwing your, your hat into the political ring, it's not a far off or, um, I guess, uh, something that's so... Like, Sorry, I'm just trying to articulate what I'm thinking. It's nope. not an unattainable goal. It, it really is for anyone. Anyone can make a difference. Anyone's voice can matter. Yeah. You you've used the word engagement a lot over the last few minutes that we've been talking, and I want to pick up on mm -hmm. that for a little bit because I, I I've been noticing a very uh, uh, a very strong undertone of apathy when it comes to municipal government. Yeah. Uh, people don't show up to municipal uh, council meetings like they used to back in the '90s or even or '80s. Uh, people aren't engaging with municipal politicians. They may in Orangeville, but in my opinion, they aren't across Canada. How do you see your role as councillor in changing the way that people engage with municipalities? Because the off the one thing I often hear is, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on, I don't care what's going on at City Hall. But, no, so engagement is it's a huge piece. Um, so when I was running provincially, a lot of a lot of people didn't have knowledge of the issues, right? The key issues. And at the door, you would kind of be um giving your elevator pitch, but it also turned into just talking about what what people should care about. But it's not my job to tell people what they they should be worried about. It should impact their lives directly. Um, you often find sometimes engagement is born out of um capital projects not being completed on time or things that might impede people's flow of their daily life, like a traffic interruption, right? So sometimes engagement comes in the form of negativity, but it, I, it's just people are busy. There's an affordability crisis. People are working two jobs. They're just going from point A to point B and are exhausted. So I don't blame the average person for having low engagement. It's, it's a difficult time right now to care about other things. 
right? When just worrying about your own life and survival is a huge issue for a lot of people. So that is, that's something that I'm really aware of. I've always been hyper interested in politics and how I can help in this regard. And I think if you have people like myself or other like-minded uh, municipal politicians to kind of direct people to where maybe um, their energies should be focused, it is helpful. Uh, engagement can come through social media. I try to do a lot on Instagram. Um, our town communication department is doing a fantastic job just trying to solicit um, resident replies. Our mayor, Lisa Post, has started with new town hall meetings with um, different councillors on different specialized topics. So we're trying our best. We did have such a low voter turnout in 2022 um, that, you know, we're really hoping that we will increase that. And um, I think the median voter age in Orangeville might have been some somewhere around 60 years old. So it's just trying, trying to engage that younger voter. How do we make um, the younger person, younger family, know that their vote does matter. A lot of the times the apathy is just born out of thinking that it won't matter who I vote for. It won't matter if I vote. You know what? But it does. It does matter. Every voice matters. We saw that with the green bell reversal, right? Every person counts. And uh, I tell that to my students all the time. Never feel defeatist about any of this kind of stuff because every voice adds up to 10,000 voices, 30,000 voices, and then people have to pay attention. I want to turn to one last subject before we turn to the next subject, which is going to talk about those affordability crisis and the issues of Orangeville and the accomplishments of Orangeville. I, I want to know when you do get stopped as a local official, is there an understanding of the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays compared to the other levels of government? Will you get stopped and be asked about health care issues? Because you, you talked about at the top of the interview about uh, health care is not a, a municipal issue, but it does impact municipalities. So when you talk to residents, when they do engage with you, are they talking about the issues that are in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality? You know, um, not always, not always. Uh, and are you okay with that? I am. Uh, you know, I, I teach <laughs> civics to grade fives, so I can talk about um, the charter and section 92. I can address things and just talk about how, or redirect, rather redirect the resident to our member of provincial parliament, Sylvia Jones, if they have questions about healthcare or education, you know, and just really trying to be that facilitator and connect people to the best person to answer their question. I find that's also a really big role of municipal politicians. Um, here at school, I'm a librarian. I find people resources that will help them. And I think that's a big part of being a municipal politician. You get an email about, let's say a parking complaint or a bylaw infraction. It's how can we help this person find solutions? Um, but to go back to your question, yeah, sometimes it, it is confusing, right? We have this division of powers, something's a federal, provincial, municipal, finding that the municipalities kind of um, have the uh, the real consequence of perhaps a funding or a lack of funding uh, for certain provincial initiatives. And, um, you know, just trying to help, help people understand that there are only certain things under our purview. Orangeville is um, part of uh, a two-tier municipality, oh. right? So we have the, we have the County of Dufferin, which is responsible for waste management. So if someone has a complaint, let's say about garbage pickup, I'll help direct them to the county. Housing um, and homelessness, that's also part of the county here. And as much as Orangeville would like to help, we have to work in partnership with the county. We are the big urban hub of our county. Um, so we see a lot of the um, the big, big city, I'm saying big city, 30,000 people. But we see a lot of the bigger issues where people have to come to Orangeville for services, right? So we um, are addressing those in a, in a different way just because of the, the nature of the geography of our area. Uh, I, I just want to say that this is a policy of uh, this is not a policy of council or direction of council or motion of council. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. Councillor, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Orangeville today? Well, in Orangeville, we want to grow our community. We want people to move here. We want Orangeville to thrive. And it's really key to embracing our diversity, which really strengthens our community. We want to keep taxes low and we don't really have a lot of space to grow outwards. We're 15 kilometers squared. A lot of our growth will be through infill. Um, but the challenges in so far as that will be accommodating our growth while maintaining the historic charm that Orangeville has to offer. It's a really beautiful main street. 
the infrastructure needs, though, associated with that growth are huge. We're working right now uh, with the provincial government to increase our water capacity, uh, which really needs to be addressed. And before we grow any further, we're going to have to increase our water capacity. Is that hard to and do? Like other is that um, hard to do? Because growth is good. You've been mandated by the province to grow your communities <laughs> by a certain amount. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. if the Orangeville has signed on to the housing pledge, but uh, there is uh, housing pledges from the federal, the, the Ford government to do that. And you have to do that with the limited supply of money that you have when we talk about the affordability crisis. So growth is good but infrastructure is needed for that growth. Do you see yourself being able to balance the needs and the wants of your community while that growth is happening? Uh, I think we can, I think we can. Um, luckily we don't have a lot of, we don't have any ability for sprawl in Orangeville because our settlement and geographic boundaries are one and the same and they're maxed out essentially. Um, so um, other issues affecting different areas like the region of Peel, which is soon to be um, dissolved, but our neighbors to the south, Caledon, you know, they they have vast expanses of land that will need to be hooked up to infrastructure if some of their subdivision plans go through. Orangeville, luckily, we we won't have that, but it's just servicing the people that continue to live here. And water is going to be a huge challenge moving forward. Um, we're looking to get a well online soon, and there are conversations to expedite that process with the provincial government. Um, so just... Things, things like that, that the average citizen, I would say, does not have knowledge of, you know, um, but are there really important things to making the town work? We all need water, right? Sewage is very important. The moment your water, your sewage backs up, you know that that sewage is backed up and you call your local counselor. Um, it, it brings up a good conversation here because infrastructure needs and wants are very important for communities that are going through this growth that Orangeville is going through. But there's a limited supply of money, and particularly on that compound, the affordability crisis, where things are costing more to do business. A pipe underground is not a million dollars anymore. It could be ranging 10 to 15 million, depending on what type of issues are uh, found when you're doing uh, that initial engineering stages. How do you see yourself as council and council in ensuring that the growth happens, but not on the back of the residents who are there right now and who are going through that affordability crisis that you've talked about a few times already? Well, we have to make sure that we have strong partnerships with those that are developing our uh, our lands. And I, hopefully um, people will be developing and moving uh, into areas or developing areas that are already hooked up to infrastructure. Again, we're, we're pretty lucky that we are small insofar ge geographically that there isn't um, going to be much demand on creating subdivisions that aren't already connected to our existing infrastructure. It's just building our water capacity is, uh, is a huge issue right now. Servicing these new communities and making sure that um, current residents have the service level that they are accustomed to. Um, you've talked about infrastructure, you've talked about affordability a lot in this conversation already. Mm -hmm. Um, but as someone who has been to Orangeville in the last few months, I was there in August and I met with your mayor for about two minutes as she was going into a next meeting. I had the pleasure of just visiting your downtown core. And surprisingly, your people like to talk. Your people like to talk when you ask them questions about what's going on in the community. And they gave me a range of issues that were going on in the community. What they saw were the pressing issues, whether it be potholes, whether it be road repairs, whether it be snow clearing, even in the middle of August, for some reason, they were talking about snow clearing. <laughs> um, how do you see yourself in balancing the needs and wants of the individual with the needs and wants of the community? Because you have to be there to represent everyone and you have to be there to represent the people, even if they didn't vote for you. And balance their needs with the balance of what council wants the city to do and or the town to do to grow. So how do you see your role in balancing those needs? I think it it just it's about synthesizing all of the comments that come your way. Um, and again, earlier I said some sometimes the detractors are the most negative observation. That's the one that you hear the most. You don't hear the accolades coming uh, through Facebook comments. Let's just say that. Um, you don't say, counselor. You don't say. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you can't let that deter you from trying your best and, and really trying to enhance your community, um, which I need to remind myself of sometimes. But you need a thick skin to enter this game, let me tell you. Uh 
But yeah, we hear about snow removal and that the, you know, the sidewalk plow eats up some of the grass and it happens. And you know what, then the town replaces that part of the grass, but our sidewalks are this size and the blade of the snow plow is this size. And that might be a conversation I have 800 times every winter, but it's okay because I have an answer for it. And when you look at the, the cost, um, that it's it's nominal to do those small repairs, let's say. Our Carnegie Library, the Mill Street Library, which really is a jewel of our community, it is slated to open in November. And the ren the renovations there are just phenomenal. There's gonna be a green living wall. Um, I'm also on the library board. I'm a teacher librarian, so I'm a little bit biased, but uh, books are awesome. It's a true meeting place for the community and it will be open soon. It's also a place for um, the more vulnerable individuals in our community when it gets cold. You know, it's right downtown and it's a safe place for people to go to. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that that is going to be open before it does get cold. And the librarians that work there, the staff, the frontline staff are phenomenal and they're doing everything they can to get it up and running as soon as possible. Um, I, I've been accused on this show of only talking about the negative issues that municipalities are facing. So I'm going to throw uh, reverse the question a little bit for you here. And I did not prepare you for this question. I'm going to ask, What's there to be proud about Orangeville? What What's the issues that you look at and you say, you know what, we're doing this right. When you talk to other municipal leaders from across Ontario or even your residents who might not know, mm -hmm. and you say, you know what, you may have your detractions about what's going on at City Hall, but we're getting this right. And this is the issues that you should be looking at because we're far above other municipalities on these issues. I think one, one pillar right now is the free transit pilot. You know, um, just seeing why, that. Why that was that important for Orangeville to go that route? You know, um, there was a councillor last term uh, who brought up the idea as something to do because our revenue from transit was nominal. Um, $100,000 a year, maybe something like that. And, um, you know, we just thought this might be something to try. And it has increased ridership. We have a new transit hub and we're seeing um, such such an overwhelming positive response, even from people at first who thought, I don't want my tax dollars to go to someone to ride the bus for free. And, you know, we, we hear that kind of stuff. But but now those same individuals are saying, you know, this is actually working. I see a line of people waiting to ride the bus. And now those empty buses driving around town aren't empty anymore. And now children who normally would ask for a ride from their parents to go to their after school job are electing to take the bus. <laughs> so we're promoting public transit as a viable option, which is good for the environment and for the community. You know, Orangeville recently received a federal grant to study the feasibility of the electrification of our municipal fleet. And so as we move forward, hopefully to a more sustainable future, uh, this is one way that Orangeville is kind of doing its little part. Another really great thing about this town is our council. We have a very progressive council who is always trying to work together and um, you know we have our differences here and there, but we're always looking in the in the eyes of progress. For a small town, we have a pride event, celebrate your awesome, which is really important to me. I want to live in a place where everyone is welcome, where everyone feels like they're at home, and no one ever should feel like they don't belong. And I think that we're creating that here in town. Uh, I'm very cautious of time here, and we're at the half hour mark, and I want to turn to my last segment before I have to let you go, because I know you're a busy person, and you have many uh, balls in the air right now. I want to talk about my favorite subject, and that's tourism. I love tourism. I enjoy tourism. I visited uh, Orangeville, and I feel like I've just scratched the surface. I'm planning to come back this summer, or next summer, I should say, 2024 summer, and hopefully go a little bit more deeper into the uh, tourist spots and the hidden gems. So as a counselor, as someone who's an ambassador, to quote your own words yeah. of your community what do you tell people to do in orangeville when they get there well um the first thing you should take a walk down broadway our main street we have many fantastic shops and restaurants every saturday morning right outside of town hall we have a farmer's market which is it's really a treat we have local food vendors um people that make honey we have uh, wonderful stops along the way. The first weekend in June, we have the Orangeville Blues and Jazz Festival, which attracts multitudes of people from all over Ontario. And it, it really is a small town community feel. We have a vibrant art scene. Um, we have Theatre Orangeville, which is actually in City Hall, or I shouldn't say City, Town Hall. <laughs> and we put on many fantastic 
uh, shows. And they also serve as school children during the year. And really, if you're looking for a fancy night out, you can go to the theater, you can go have a meal at one of the fantastic restaurants downtown. But in addition to that, um, I'm a real outdoors type person. Orangeville is amazing on its own, but what makes Orangeville fantastic is access to the trails and the hiking and the breweries and the wineries of Dufferin County and Caledon. You know, you are 20 minutes away from the Bruce Trail. You're five minutes away from Island Lake, which is an eight kilometer trail run by the Credit Valley Conservation. It's just outside of town in Mono. It kind of shares a border with Mono and Dufferin or Orangeville. And, you know, you have eight kilometers, you feel like you're in the forest, you're in the middle of nowhere. So you can always escape for that kind of connecting with nature, but also have the ease and access of having a vibrant downtown right there. It really is the best place to live. You know, I, I love living in Orangeville. Um, so I've got to ask that question because it is the million dollar question that I end all my interviews off with. And I think it's an important question. I think everyone needs to, every municipal leader needs to be able to answer this. What makes Orangeville such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family, Councillor? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it's an hour away from Toronto. I grew up in Toronto. I grew up in Scarborough. Um, and it was really hard to access nature. You never felt like it was close. Here you do, and you can. And I think with the busyness of our current society, it's nice to get in touch with the trees. Right now, Orangeville, we have a huge goal of reaching a 40% tree canopy by 2040. You know, we prioritize the environment. And I I do believe that Ontarians crave that. We we want greenery around us. And Orangeville has that to offer. In addition to that, it is a, a beautiful place to raise a family. You feel safe. You feel safe walking down the street. You know people when you run into them. Though sometimes um, you might feel like we're paying taxes uh, for services and you might not always see that the same way. You're paying for what you get. You know, we have a small town. It's a it's a real community feeling. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a, give Orangeville a little boast here for a second because, as I said, I was just there in August, and <laughs> yeah. uh, I got I got lost yeah. in Orangeville because my cell phone wasn't working because I had the worst cell reception in the history of the world, <laughs> being from oh, Alberta no. driving through Ontario. And a lovely couple from the at the SO station that I was filling up my gas pointed me in the right direction and got me to the exact place that I need to go, which was Town Hall. And then on top of that, as I was walking downtown, people were asking me where I was from because they saw my Alberta license uh, on my car. They're going, oh, well, why, what brings you to Orangeville? So I had to explain. And then to peace to resistance, and this, I, I didn't even tell the mayor this because it was as I was leaving, I was going through Tim Hortons and the person in front of me paid for my coffee. So I don't know what's going on in Orangeville, but you guys are a friendly community and I would come back in a heartbeat. So thank you so much for this. And thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you so much. You know, Orangeville is a, it's a friendly place. It really is a nice town. Um, if I could choose anywhere to live, I would choose to live in Orangeville. You know, I, we have a sense of community through and through. And even though, as we mentioned before, sometimes there can be negative comments, but I always look at it like this. If we're not looking at things through a critical or cynical eye, sometimes some it, we won't beget any change. We can't be complacent with what we have, right? You need to always be looking and searching for ways to do things better. And sometimes um, through that kind of analysis that you get from the resident, you're, you're able to surmise if there is a way to do something better. Or maybe you hadn't seen it through that lens before. So any kind of comment, any kind of feedback, it's good feedback. It truly is. Uh, Councillor, I want to thank you so much for the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this. But I also want to say thank you for serving your community. It takes a lot to serve your community at the municipal level because you are constantly a municipal politician. But it seems like you are a true ambassador for Orangeville. And I think Orangeville is better served with you at the council table. So thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. 
Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.